Uh, today's sermon is going to be a little different. So if you're new to Liberty Heights Church, you may walk away from this sermon today and go, that's kind of an odd sermon. Let me tell you on the front end, we totally agree, all right? But if you've been coming here for the last several years, it's going to feel a little more familiar. And here's why. Uh, for at least the last four years, we've had an emphasis in the summer uh, called Super Summer. It's a five-week emphasis. And so we kicked it off last week with our all-campus gathering and food truck rally to kind of kick off the summer. And then uh, we wrap it up with usually two guest speakers uh, on the end. And so, uh, and then in the middle, what we've done the last four years is we've kind of taught a two-week series uh, on basically anything you can submit a question and we'll just teach around whatever your questions are. So it's a little different format. Uh, we're going to bounce around a little bit, but it's been a lot of fun for us for the last several years. And so uh, one of the reasons that we do this um, is just to realize this. That there's, there are things we can teach the whole counsel of God's word, and uh, people still say, hey, that's, that's great, but, but what about this? I've always wondered about this, or what's our position on this? And uh, here's the thing that's uh, consistent every year, even though the questions differ. Uh, here's what's consistent. Every single year, we get way, way more questions than we can answer uh, in two weeks and you know, 30, 40 minutes each time. So what we try to do is we, if any questions get repeated uh, by multiple people, we say, hey, clearly more than one person uh, has a question about that, so we teach on that. Or if we just say, hey, as pastors, this is a question that in our pastoral ministry over the years, we've answered lots of times, so lots of people uh, wonder the answer to that kind of question. Now, I say all that to say this. Uh, we can't answer all the questions in two weeks. And so if you submitted a question and uh, by the end of next week and we didn't answer that, uh, hear me this morning. Send us an email. And if you'll email us, then we'll answer that question. One of our pastors will follow up and say, hey, we didn't have time to get to that great question. Here's the answer to that question. So whether teaching live or via email, uh, we're going to do our best to answer all of your questions. And I think there's precedent in Scripture uh, for spiritual leaders taking time in their teaching uh, to address the actual questions people have. So the book of 1 Corinthians, uh, there's a natural division in the book of 1 Corinthians. Uh, in the first six chapters, Paul's writing uh, to address some concerns he had uh, that he had heard uh, through the rumor mill. Paul planted that church, won those people to Christ, went on to plant another church, but word got back to Paul and they said, hey, the church you planted, uh, things aren't going so well. And so Paul writes to them in the first six chapters is Paul writing to them, giving them instruction or honestly correction on some things. But beginning in chapter 7, here's how chapter 7 in 1 Corinthians opens up. It opens up like this. Paul says, now concerning the things which you have written to me. So in other words, uh, Paul addressed some things and they heard his counsel and waited through all that. And they said, okay, we received that correction. But we've also got other questions. And they word got back to Paul, their questions. And so Paul, starting in chapter 7, begins to teach through all these questions that they had sent back to him. And he starts off with marriage and divorce and remarriage and sex and all those kind of things in chapter 7. So we see this precedent uh, in Scripture. And our heart in following this uh, pattern is to equip you to glorify God in every single area of your life. And there are some areas we don't always know exactly what that looks like. And we want to submit ourselves to the authority of Scripture in every area because to submit ourselves to the authority of Scripture is to surrender our lives to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, who is the Word made flesh. All right? So without further ado, uh, let's get started. Now, this first question uh, was asked by multiple people, and it's not really a Bible question, uh, but it's a good question. Again, multiple people ask it. It's a real issue that's going on, and so I'm just going to hit it head on like we always do. Uh, so here's the question that... Uh, came up uh, in light of the uh, questions regarding the findings dealing with the uh, sexual abuse investigation within the Southern Baptist Convention. What's our church's thoughts? How do we respond to this? Uh, that question came up multiple times in there, and it's a good question, so we're going to address it head on. Now, I realize that for some of you, I just made you aware of an issue that you previously may not be uh, aware of, and so uh, I would encourage you to Google uh, Southern Baptist uh, Sexual Abuse Task Force, and you'll find more information that you can read. You can find the actual report that came out, almost 300 uh, pages. So uh, we've been aware of that. Uh, I've been pastoring Southern Baptist churches for over 20 years. My degrees are from Southern Baptist institutions. And so uh, we're just going to hit this head on as we always do. Let me make a couple brief comments and then uh, maybe speak specifically about how we should continue our partnership uh, with the convention in the days ahead. And let me just say this. Partnership is the right word. Here's why. Every single Southern Baptist church is its own self-governing autonomous congregation. 
It's a voluntary partnership, not a denominational hierarchy. We own our buildings. We're self-governing. So our participation in the convention is voluntarily for the work of missions both domestically and internationally. So we're a self-governing church. We own our own property, or actually the bank does, I guess. And uh, we (laughs) make our own decisions. We don't have pastors appointed to us like some other denominations. So we're an autonomous church voluntarily partnering with the network of churches known as the Southern Baptist Convention, okay? So first off, let me just say this. The report uh, is beyond sickening and shameful. Uh, For the first time in in over 20 years, uh, I have been embarrassed to be associated with our national network of of churches. Uh, Yet at the same time, I'm also encouraged uh, that the majority of those present uh, voted to conduct a full investigation and waive uh, client attorney privilege so that the full display could be put out there. And what was discovered uh, in the report was a long-standing pattern uh, by denominational lawyers and executive committee staff members to not engage with documented abuse survivors and at times to belittle and intimidate them in an effort to avoid legal action that might severely damage the institution through litigation known as the Southern Baptist Convention. It, it's documented. It's not a question about that. So let me just be clear. If the work uh, of the Southern Baptist Convention all over the world is contingent on concealing abuse, uh, then let the whole thing burn down. Uh, God doesn't need the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, but he deserves to be glorified in the way that we conduct our missional efforts. And so the challenge, though, is this. For churches, I've already some churches saying, hey, we're, we're pulling out of that. We don't want to be a part of that. We grieve that our money went to that for decades, some millions of dollars. And so uh, the challenge in making a quick decision about that is this is that we've made uh, commitments to missionaries all over the world, financial commitments all over the world. And if we pull out immediately and say, hey, we don't want any part of that, uh, it's it's tarnished, um, then what happens is we end up punishing the missionaries who were not a part of the problem as a response to those who were a part of the problem uh, in doing that. And so for us, our current denominational giving uh, does not support the entity of the Southern Baptist Convention, the the way you can direct your giving in certain ways. And so we have... Uh, We're not giving directly to to whatever uh, the executive committee, the cooperative uh, program. And instead, all of our offerings uh, temporarily are going to support missionaries directly on the field, both domestically and internationally. So we're still giving the same amount we've been giving. Uh, We're just giving through funds that directly support. So I'm going to throw out a couple terms here. And some of you are like, who are these people? Some of you are like, I I thought those people died. Uh, Lottie Moon, Annie Armstrong. uh, Some of you are like, who is that? Is that someone who goes to church here? Are they a member? I remember telling someone, hey, we're giving uh, Annie Armstrong years ago, and someone said, good night, my church's been giving to her for 50 years. Haven't we paid that loan off, right? So these are just missionaries uh, who represent missional offerings. One is a representative of a domestic missions giving, church planting. One is international. So we can direct our giving 100% to those, and it goes directly to the missionaries, and that's what we're doing uh, in the meantime until uh, some of this gets sorted out. Now, uh, there's no question The cover-up and grievous sin took place by a small but powerful uh, minority in our denominational leadership. And so the question remains is now that that's been exposed, uh, will the necessary measures of reform actually be uh, voted into place uh, this week at the National Convention? Or will it mostly be lip service to repair our damaged brand identity? Uh, Truth and time go hand in hand. And even the thought of bringing missionaries off the field is grievous. Uh, but it's not nearly as grievous as a thought of genuine re- repentance that leads to actual reform uh, taking place. And so, uh, we're beyond sickened. Uh, as your pastors, I can speak for all of you unanimously because we've all spent a lot of time talking about this. Uh, and uh, we're also grieved at the thought that genuine repentance may not uh, take place. Uh, but we want to be patient and we want to observe. Yes, this has been discovered. And is uh, the convention, are they going to vote to deal with this in a way that is, uh, actual reform is taking place? Uh, to protect those who have generally been abused and victimized, or uh, is it just lip service? And then once that plays out, honestly, over the next weeks and couple months, then we can kind of give counsel to our church and say, hey, here's, here's, uh, here's what's played out, and so let's prayerfully consider what does this partnership look like moving forward. So that question got asked multiple times. Again, we don't skirt around difficult issues here. We just try and hit them head on. So we're very, very, very aware of it. Uh, what's going on, a lot's going to play out uh, in the news over the uh, next week. And so be in prayer about that, that genuine reform uh, uh, facilitated by genuine repentance will take place. And let me say this on a local level. As far as I know, uh, no instances of abuse have, have, have taken place here that, that I'm aware of. 
And uh, the, the best that we know how, we've taken every single measure to protect against abuse. Everybody that works with a minor has a background check. There's windows in all the doors. Uh, pastors want to counsel with women by themselves. You're not allowed to be in a car with a woman by yourself. You're not allowed to be at lunch with a woman by yourself, all those kind of things. So, uh, so we're not aware of anything uh, in, the, in the 12 and a half years that I've been here. We've taken every measure the experts have said. You should, these are all the things you should do. We've implemented all those to the best of our abilities. But uh, if it does happen, uh, let me say this openly and then uh, move on. We will not handle criminal acts internally. How abuse gets continued at church is they say, well, let's just handle this internally, let's forgive each other, because if this got out in the public, uh, then we would uh, damage the, the reputation of Christ. Can I just tell you this, that if abuse is happening in the church swept under the rug, the reputation of Christ is being damaged. And so, we won't deal with it just internally. Uh, the Bible uh, will deal with it externally. Uh, the Bible says that, hey, there are measures of sin in the church that should be dealt with in the church, and there are criminal acts that should be dealt with by the government, is what Scripture says. And so the Bible says that, uh, Romans 13, that the means of human government is God-ordained to punish evildoers. And so we will report crimes. Uh, we are mandated reporters. And so we will report crimes. We will not handle them internally and sweep them under the rug. We will uh, prosecute to the fullest extent of the law. And so if you've got bad ill intentions here, and think about that, uh, I'd move it on down the road. Amen? All right. How about something a little lighter for our second question? Amen? <laughs> How was church today? We used hymnals. Uh, it was a big downer. And I don't know what happened. I blacked out. All right? So here's the second question. Again, that, that's just, a, that's just, we just we're going to hit things head on. That came up multiple times. That's a, that's a fair question to ask. If I'm a member of giving money to a Sunday Baptist church, what, how do we deal with all this? And so we're keeping a careful eye on that and watching out what plays out uh, in the days ahead so that we make wise recommendations to our church on what that partnership looks like uh, in the days ahead. So here's the second question, a little lighter. Will we have jobs in heaven? <laughs> I think some people groaned. Some of you are getting ready to get some bad news, right? Because you hate your job and you're like, Lord, deliverance finally will come one day, right? I will no longer have to do fill in the blank, right? Uh, so I've heard some people, a uh, person this, I've heard we'll have jobs. Uh, some people said, uh, will our service now correlate to the job you've been given on earth? Also, we'll be doing these jobs during a thousand year reign of Christ, uh, Jesus on the earth. So, what a great question. Uh, one of the things I will tell you that, uh, in critiquing our own teaching here, and I've had this conversation even this week with our teaching pastors, we work very, very hard at teaching the Bible in a way that you can live it out practically. We work really hard at that. But sometimes in our emphasis for practical Bible teaching in the real life that you're living, sometimes I feel like we've neglected teaching on eternity. We're trying to equip people for the here and now, and that's good, but I think sometimes it's uh, at the expense of teaching uh, enough on eternity, so we've got that in some of our future teaching plans, so, but I, I love the thought of uh, spending some time here and focusing on heaven, and uh, for those of you who hate your job, uh, bad news, the answer is yes, okay? Uh, Revelation chapter 14, verse 13 says this, that believers will rest from their labor. It doesn't say that labor itself will cease, but, but in the fall of the curse, what happened is this, it's not that work was bad before the fall, it's that after the fall, uh, part of the curse was he said, hey, by the sweat of your brow will you eat bread. In other words, labor became much more labor intensive. And so work existed in the garden as a part of God's good creation. God gave them the responsibility of work to tend to the garden. God gave them the responsibility to have dominion over the animals and to name them. So work existed before the fall. And I know for some of you, that's the bad news, right? Work is a part of God's good creation, but the fall tarnished all of that. And so that's a result of the fall, is that work is not always uh, enjoyable. So the Bible describes work as good. It's something that's fulfilling and, uh, again, instituted before the fall. And so in Genesis uh, chapter 3, or Genesis chapter 2, listen to verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden, listen to this, to work it and to keep it. And so that's pre-fall from Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 2, he said, hey... I'm going to put you in the garden, but you're not sitting around eating grapes all day. You're going to have to work. So work was a part of God's good design, and the fall marred it or diminished it. So God gave them uh, dominion over all of the earth. And so when we think about the narrative of the gospel, creation, fall, redemption, and restoration, that, that's the narrative of the storyline of the Bible. 
creation, fall, redemption, restoration of all things. There's these two bookends. And so in creation, work was a part of that. And in the, the bookend of restoration, work will be restored to the rightful place that God has. So in the beginning, all things were perfect. In the end, all things will be made perfect. And basically what the Bible says is in the middle, because of sin, things can be a little jacked up. Amen? And so that's what he's describing when it comes to work as well. And so in the meantime, uh, Colossians 3 says, whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart as working for the Lord. And so I don't think we'll spend all of our days, uh, you know, sitting around on a cloud playing a harp. Uh, lots of people say, what, what is heaven going to be like? The Bible just gives us some glimpses uh, of that. But we'll be doing jobs that are serving the Lord. I uh, heard one person say it like this. Uh, one uh, Bible teacher said, maybe your hobby will become your job in heaven. I, I don't know. Now, some of you thinking, that'd be great. That'd absolutely be great. I had a guy tell me one time, he said, you know what? I just imagine heaven's right around, We're just from Pay Lake to Pay Lake, filled with bass, and I'm just yanking right out of there, right? Another guy one time, he said, hey, I just think heaven's one big NASCAR race. I said, no, 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 that would be hell. Amen? <laughs> or the, play the banjo, right? And serve chicken salad for lunch every day, or tuna salad, whatever you don't like there. Egg salad, call it what it is. So what does this actually look like? What are the jobs in heaven? Uh, here's one thing, I, I don't know all that, but here's what I do know, worship. That the primary work of heaven is worship. Now we think about that and think, man, like if the song service goes over by three or four minutes, like I'm out, right? And I see you leaving during the invitation, by the way, okay? And so all this time in heaven, but here's the thing, my, my body will, and mind will no longer be restrained and corrupted by sin, that it will fully be embraced in the worship of Jesus Christ. And so we don't owe all the activities of heaven, but there will be work in heaven, and it will be restored to the rightful place, and there will be joy in it, not toil. All right? So uh, third question, what is the biblical stance on uh, cremation? And I think what a person is really asking is, is it a sin to be cremated? So we've been doing this for, for four years, uh, this Ask Anything series. And so in that time, there have probably been, I don't know, 100 or 150 questions come in. Uh, this is the only question that every single year has came in. This is the question that every single year someone or multiple people have asked this question. I spent a lot of time teaching on this last year, but it keeps getting asked over and over. So I'm not going to teach as long, but I want to address it again because clearly this is a question that people wonder about. And, and if I'm guessing, I think lots of people have been taught incorrectly uh, about. Okay? So um, let me tell you some things uh, about this. Why this uh, answered so, or asked so frequently? I think it's because we know that uh, God values our, our human bodies. Uh, we, we, are not, we are not just body, we are not just soul, we are body and soul, so God created us that way. Matter of fact, the Bible says in the resurrection, we'll be reunited with our glorified bodies, even the unsaved. Uh, there'll be a resurrection of the dead to stand before the great white throne judgment. Their physical bodies will be resurrected to stand before the great white throne judgment. So clearly, there's a theology of the body uh, in the Bible. And so because the Bible teaches about that, people wonder, is it a sin against your body to, to cremation? Paul describes this resurrection of the body. He says, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. And so uh, we see this uh, value of, of uh, the theology of the body in the way that we take care of uh, the deceased in, in our culture. Listen, if we didn't value the actual body, uh, we'd have all kinds of more efficient means of uh, disposing of a body, but we care for the body because the, that's where the soul has indwelled. And again, the Bible speaks of a theology of the body. So, so why is there all this confusion about this? Well, here's why I think uh, some of it is. Uh, I've heard people say this over the years, that if you get cremated, uh, that when you, uh, when Christ comes back in the rapture, whether it's pre, mid, post, whatever you believe about that, right? Uh, when Christ comes back, then, then your, your body is disintegrated, so it can't be resurrected back uh, into new life. So let me just uh, address that head on. First... Uh, our bodies decompose over time, uh, even if they're buried, okay? Uh, think about all the Christians from the first century church. Uh, they didn't uh, utilize modern embalming techniques, and so their, their bodies are, are gone. They've completely uh, decomposed. Uh, God said in Genesis chapter 3, we're made from the dust of the ground, and upon death, we return back to that dust 
of the ground. So all cremation does is accelerate the natural process of decomposition. Think about the early church leaders who were literally burned at the stake for their faith. Does that mean they can't be resurrected into a new glorious body? Does the promise of the rapture not apply to them because God can't uh, find the bodies? Of course not. The omnipotent, all-powerful God that formed man out of the dust of the ground will surely be able to resurrect dust once again. And so all it is is speeding up the process of what naturally happens uh, in that. Now, I've heard some people say, well, in the Bible, uh, fire uh, is symbolic of judgment. And so therefore, we don't, you know, a person who's in Christ, we don't want to go through that. Uh, listen, in the Bible, fire is also symbolic of purification. Okay, so we see both these arguments. But I think most of it is people are afraid that if a person's cremated, then in the rapture, that body can't be resurrected. I'm just telling you that God is not limited by the laws of the, the order right here. God is infinite and exists outside the realm of time time and space all right so no nothing wrong with that and I've heard lots of people let me just say this pastorally that lots of people experience uh, and express an extreme amount of guilt that due to financial concerns they had to cremate someone and was that wrong was that a sin listen uh, the Bible never calls it a sin and so you have the freedom to do that without wondering did I involve something uh, in myself in something that is sinful okay so no it's not a sin to cremate someone it's okay to prefer burial that, that's totally fine but it's not a sin to choose cremation. That question literally has come up every single time uh, we've done this. Okay? Next question. Uh, how are we as Christians to engage in a world that is increasingly hostile to God's design for marriage, gender, uh, sexuality? Now, uh, we could spend weeks answering this question. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we attempted to in the series we just taught called uh, Love Is. And uh, here's what I want to tell you a couple of things that we try to teach through that. Uh, the first idea is this. There is no impact without contact. And so sometimes when, when culture drifts away from a biblical worldview, uh, sometimes people, people retreat, right? Sometimes people retreat, and so we've uh, spent a lot of time homeschooling our kids, and so we've seen a lot of that retreat mentality in those homeschool circles, right? And so they're in those white 15 pastor vans so they can drive far away from the evil world, amen? It was a joke, I'm sorry. So the other mentality is to not retreat. It's to engage angrily and to stand across and picket those things that we're against. And the problem with that is this, is that in picketing, what I'm saying is someone else is the problem, right, with the world. You ever seen a picketer hold up a sign marching around? I'm the problem. Never. So sometimes we distance ourselves through retreat and just retreat from the world and culture, and instead of engaging in salt and light, sometimes we engage, but it's in a very angry, combat, culture war kind of Christianity. So the approach uh, that we see Jesus modeling with the woman at the well in John chapter 4 that we just taught through is that if you're going to impact people for Jesus Christ, you're going to have to do it up close. You can condemn someone from a distance, but you cannot make an impact without being close to them. Now, here's the fear of that. That in an effort to love everybody will end up as an endorsement for everything. So in other words, if I show love and serve that person who does not hold to a biblical worldview on gender and sexuality and marriage and those kind of things, and if I show love to them, then it's going to feel like I'm actually uh, endorsing what they're doing. So let me just say this. We said this in the series. Love is unconditional love is not the same as unconditional affirmation. How do I know that? Because that's what Christ did for all of us. That he loved us unconditionally, but yet never affirmed our sin. How do I know that? Because had he affirmed or approved of our sin, he would have never had to go to the cross to make payment for that sin. The Bible says in Romans 5 8 that God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so to love someone unconditionally without approving of everything they do or believe uh, openly is modeling the gospel of Jesus Christ. Christ. And so, uh, what does that look like practically? How, how do you do that practically? Uh, find some activities that aren't centered around the church and make friends with people from different walks of life and different uh, world's views. Listen, if you're an introvert, get online and join some groups and be open about your faith without being obnoxious about it and engage the people who don't know Christ. Listen, let me just say this again. I've said this a hundred times. Let me say it again. Unsaved people who do not have a biblical worldview are not the enemy, they're the mission field. 
And if you want to reach people, you're going to have to build a relationship with people without affirming everything that they do and believe and all those things. So what we're trying to do is to do good works with the goal of gaining an audience for the good news. And in a world filled with division, anger, and hate, there's nothing more evangelistic you can do than to build a bridge with someone who does not hold to a Christian worldview with the goal of letting Christ walk across the bridge from your heart to theirs. So, we love people unconditionally without approving what they do um, openly in doing that. That's how we do that. But you're not going to impact anybody from a distance. You can retreat from them. You can get angry and pick it at them. But you're not going to impact them. Okay? Next question. Um, Please speak on the thought of, you made me angry and that's why I fill in the blank. Uh, I know that people uh, don't take, always take accountability for their actions. Uh, they can blame someone else for their reactions. So when you teach, you may be angry, and that's why I feel like, how do, how do we deal with that? So, so here's, the, here's the short answer, and this is, <laughs> this is bad news as well. I'm going to tell you something. Nobody can make you angry. Did you know that? Now, some of you are thinking, hey, you've not met my kids. Amen? Like after church, I'm going to introduce you to someone. They can do it. Here's the problem with it. The Bible says... All that people can do is simply expose the anger that was already in your heart. They can't put anger in your heart as a root, but they can expose the anger that's already in there. Uh, We've used this illustration over and over uh, in counseling and teaching and and sometimes probably even in preaching. Uh, It's from the uh, late author and biblical counselor David Pallison. And so David Pallison uh, has an illustration is what he says. So uh, I'm going to do something I never, never do. Uh, so can one of you bring me that water bottle right there on the front? Wish you had been someone submissively from my family, but Seth, I would appreciate you bringing that up there as well. Yeah, so. so did that just slip out? They made me angry, what I say? So, so, so here's the deal. So in this illustration, uh, Pallison gives it, it's, a, it's really good. He, he says this, if you're holding this water bottle and the lid is off of this and you're just sitting here talking and someone comes up and is just not doing, you know, whatever, they're just running through the church, and they slam into you, and this water goes all over you, all over the floor, all over everyone around there, uh, the question becomes is this, why did that water spill out all over everything, which makes everybody mad, right? And so the, the natural answer is to say, well, the reason it spilled out is because they ran into me, and they should have been running in the church, and you know, God hates that, and you know, whatever, fill in the blank. That's the wrong answer. The reason that water came into the bottle when they ran into me is because water was in the bottle. You see, you can run into me as hard as you want, but if the bottle's empty, nothing's coming out. You can run into me as hard as you want, and if Pepsi's in the bottle, then water's not coming out. You see, the only thing that comes out of the bottle is what's already in the bottle. And so that's how it works with anger. That when someone bumps into us relationally, uh, they cannot put anger inside our hearts, but through that irritation of two sinful people coming into close contact with each other, uh, it can draw out of our hearts what was already in our hearts. And so, uh, the Bible says this in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. Be angry and sin not. Now, the reason that and is there, it's because it's separating two separate truths in one verse. Be angry, truth one, and separation, sin not. So what's he teaching there in Ephesians 4, 26? That there is an anger that is not sinful. It's a, what we would call righteous uh, indignation. This is a, a, an anger, an appropriate anger towards sin. Uh, when I'm being sinned against, ultimately all sins against God when other people are being sinned against. So when I, going back to our first question, read those reports of people experiencing abuse and it being concealed and little, there should be a holy anger at that injustice for every follower of Jesus Christ. When Jesus flips over the tables in the temple, that is not sinful anger, that is a righteous anger. So the sinful anger... Uh, is, is revealed out of me, uh, not when God's being sinned against, but most often when I'm being inconvenienced. And Jesus is angry. You never see him getting angry at personal inconveniences, right? Even the Bible says when they're leading him to the, to the cross for slaughter, the Bible says he didn't even open his mouth. Right? If there's ever a time to say, hey, this is a sham, I'm not guilty, this is wrong, there's injustice, the Bible says like a lamb led to a slaughter, he opened not his mouth. Mouth. But when the name of God is being dishonored, we see him flipping over tables. Now, if anger is something that is not a root, uh, rather it's a fruit. What is the root of anger? The root of anger can be many things. Let me just tell you this. The most common root of anger that gets drawn out of you 
is selfishness. Most of the time, it's selfishness. You've inconvenienced me. You messed up this thing I wanted to put together. Had this all planned out, and you did this, or I wanted this to turn out this way, or I want to control this situation. And so you didn't do what I wanted you to do, so therefore you made me angry. No, no, no. They just exposed the anger that was already inside of you because the idol of selfishness and control. So selfishness is common. It can also be rejection, a feeling that someone took something that belongs to you, neglect, unresolved bitterness, and many other unmet desires in our hearts. Now, let me just tell you, and we've taught this multiple times from James chapter 4. In idolatry, what you have is a desire. And desires are not wrong. They're God-given. Listen, if someone says, hey, I have a desire to be loved, I'm not going, what's wrong with you? That's, right? God's wired us that way. But what happens in idolatry is that a desire grows into a demand. We see this pattern in James chapter 4. And in that demand, what we're saying is this. If you don't provide, fill in the blank, comfort, control, respect, fill in the blank. If you don't provide that and that demand is not met, then I'm going to punish you most of the time through sinful anger. So the clearest indicator that an idol has taken root in your heart is that you punish the people around you through anger. And so anger is not a root. Anger is the fruit of an idol not being met. So desire, God-given, grows into a demand. Unless the desire is met, I cannot have joy, peace, fulfillment, security, happiness, identity, whatever, fill in the blank. And when you don't feed that idol, when you don't meet that demand, I will punish you. That's the clearest sign of idolatry. So anger is a fruit, not a root. Now, here's what I want you to understand. That demand that's inside of you that's going unmet, and therefore you're punishing people in anger, no one else put that demand in your heart. So therefore, no one can make you angry. They can reveal the anger already inside of you. They can bump into you and anger can spill out of you. But that demand that's not being met, they're not responsible for that. That's an idol in your heart. They're simply revealing what's already been exposed. So one of the things we say about relationships is this. Relationships are the God-ordained means of sanctification. Why? Because relationships draw out of us what we did not know was inside of us. Let me repeat that. Relationships draw out of us what we did not know was inside of us. We got married. I would have never been convinced prior to that that I was selfish. You know why? Because I always did what I wanted to do. Amen? Like if I wanted to eat here, that's where I ate. If I want to spend my time doing this, that's it. And all of a sudden, you get married, and that other person's like, well, I don't want to go there. Where do you want to go? I don't know. Wherever you want to go is fine. Wherever you want to eat is fine. Where do you want to go here? No, I don't like that place. Do you want to go here? And all of a sudden, you're making me angry, which is true. Amen. We just get that on the table. You know what it reveals? I'm selfish. And you're not meeting my selfish demands, so therefore, I'm going to get angry. And guess who's responsible for that anger? Not the person who won't feed our idols. It's those of us who let idols take root in our hearts. Okay? So that's what we mean when we say that no one can actually make you uh, angry. Now, here's what's interesting. Um, anger management is not the Bible's counsel. That's from the world of humanistic psychology. Anger management is not the Bible's counsel. Uh, the Bible doesn't say manage your anger. Here's what the Bible says. Put away anger. Uproot whatever it is that's taken root in your heart through repentance and confession, so that the fruit of anger is put away, not managed, is the biblical language in, in view on that, okay? Just newsflash, we're not going to get through all the questions, okay? Come back uh, next week. So here's another question. We'll try and get through at least uh, one or two more. Um, actually, it's the last question, but it's a long one, okay? So how are we judged as Christians when we go before Jesus? Uh, it's confusing to me because we don't get to heaven by works. Jesus has already taken our sin on the cross, but yet there's a time that Christians uh, will stand in judgment before Jesus Christ. I'm not totally sure what that means or how that actually works. That, that's, a, that's a great question, okay? So let me, uh, the Bible speaks about judgment in two forms uh, in Scripture. Uh, number one, it talks about the great white throne judgment, okay? The Bible also talks about the judgment seat of Christ. The great white throne judgment is in the book of Revelation. I think it's in chapter 20. And then the great white, or the judgment seat of Christ, also known as the Bema seat, uh, is in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Two separate judgments, two different names, two different places in Scripture. Now, as Christians, who will, who goes to what? So that unbelievers will be resurrected, reunited with their bodies for a time of judgment 
at the great white throne judgment. The Bible says that those not found written in the Lamb's book of life were cast into the lake of fire. They didn't fall over the, were looking over the edge and they fell in on accident. The Bible says they were cast into the lake of fire. And so that's an exercise of God's justice in that, all right? But the Bible talks about that only Christians stand before Jesus at the uh, judgment seat of Christ or also as the Bema seat. Now, uh, what does the Bible say about this? In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it says this. Each one's work, these are Christians, judgment seat of Christ, only Christians there. Each one's work will be, re- be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work uh, each one has done. Now, you're not there at the judgment seat of Christ to wonder, oh, am I going to get in or not? Right? Is that St. Peter or is that Lucifer? I can't see it on my contacts in, right? No. For those who are in Jesus Christ, there is no condemnation. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. The word judgment has a negative connotation, but it's a time of discernment or taking inventory. And the Bible says we can offer up things from our life at the judgment seat of Christ, and they'll be consumed by God's purifying fire through wood, hay, and stubble. What are that? Those are the things I did with the wrong motive, or I did with a temporal mindset that had no eternal impact. The Bible says also I'll offer up some things in my life, and they'll come forth as precious stones. What are those? Those are the things I leveraged for the cause of Christ or the things I did with the right motive that God is pleased with that. All right? Now, some people said, well, I was always taught that we stand before Jesus in judgment like a, like a movie screen. Pretend that the screens work, right? Like a movie screen. And all the wrong things I've done in my life are playing behind me on the screen when I stand before Jesus. You know, just one kind of final reckoning like, oh, you thought you got away with that? Turn your attention to the screens. Listen, that would not be heaven. That would be hell. When I'm condemned by my works, I'm not going to heaven because of my works. I'm going there, standing there, fully confident in the righteousness of Jesus Christ that's been credited to my account. And so this is a time. Here's a better way to think about the judgment seat of Christ. The doctrine of eternal rewards. And so when I stand before the Lord, and he says, hey, these are the things in your life that you did with the right motive, but these are the things you invested in eternity. In. And so out of that, guess what? There will be a time of reward. And the Bible talks about crowns being distributed as times of reward. Now, some people said, well, I don't like the thought of that, that I, that I did things for the sake of reward. Listen, here's the only answer I can give you. God designed that, so it's got to be good, right? And here's the difference, though. You ever go and, like, you're in some kind of award ceremony, like, Hey, they got this word, they got this word, they got this word. There's like some people out there like, I got nothing, right? And we're a little grieved or we're a little jealous. Here's the difference. When that point in eternity, my sin nature's erased, guess what? I'm actually happy that you got more rewards than I did. I'm not jealous. Why? Because jealousy has been eradicated. My sin nature has been made uh, new again. I've been glorified in Christ at that point. And here's what happens with those rewards. The Bible says that whatever crowns of reward we will get, the only thing they are are not trophies to display, but objects of worship to lay at the feet of Jesus Christ and say, hey, whatever reward has happened, whatever good thing came out of me, it's solely because of your work on my behalf on the cross and your continuing work in my life. So these are nothing more than objects of worship to lay at his feet. How good is that good news? That no one will stand before Christ who's in Christ and worry if they're going to make it. The Bible says there will be a day when the books, plural, are opened. The book of life, the book of works. The Bible says the dead, the unsaved dead, will be judged based on their works. If you ever heard someone say, hey, I just want to stand before God and be judged on the merits of my own life, here's the good news. That's exactly what the Bible says is going to happen in the book of Revelation. Here's the bad news. Every single person will have failed. But the good news is this, is that every person who receives Jesus Christ will no longer have to worry, will I make it? But how much worship will I get to display at the feet of the one who guaranteed my spot by dying in my place? The good news of the gospel is this, is if you're not sure which judgment seat you're going to stand before, you can leave here today with the full assurance that you're in Christ And one day, you'll worship and be with him forever. And so would you bow your heads this morning?
With your head bowed this morning, I just want to ask you a simple but incredibly important question. Do you know for sure that one day you'll be standing before the judgment seat of Christ in that time of reward, not based on anything that you've done, but based upon the fact that you receive Jesus Christ as the forgiveness of your sins and what he's done on your behalf. And so I'm asking you this morning, have you been born again? Has there been a time and a place or a season in your life where you recognized that compared to Jesus Christ, you were a sinner separated from God because of your sin? And you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross as payment from your sins, was buried and rose the third day. And you received him as your Lord and Savior for the forgiveness of your sins. If you've never done that or you're not sure if you've done that, here's the good news. Right now, right in your seat, right where you're at, you can pray and receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Would you do that right now? Would you just confess and say, Lord, I'm a sinner in need of forgiveness, and I believe that Jesus Christ alone paid for my sins on the cross. And today, I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I'm trusting in Christ alone to forgive me my sins. Save me from my sins, Jesus. Would you pray that right now if you've never done that? For those of you in the room, many of you in the room, and walk with Christ for a long time, would you just pray right now? Simple prayer. God, even this week, Help me to leverage every encounter, every opportunity, every relationship for your glory alone. God, may the affections of my heart be for heaven and not for here. May I leverage my life for a kingdom that will come that will not fade. Would you pray that right now? God, we're so grateful that even though the Bible doesn't give every answer to every single question we have, the Bible does offer us wisdom for all things necessary for life and godliness is what Scripture says. And God, we also acknowledge this, that Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God is what the Bible says. And so, Lord, as we go about this series, the answers to these questions, may it not be so that we just know more facts about the Bible. May it grow our hearts affections for Jesus Christ and the things that he loves and so God change us by your grace as only you can do we pray this in Christ's name amen